김경환 목사님의 설교 적그리스도의 표666 때문에 걱정하십니까가 책자로 발간되었습니다. 원하시는 분은 지금 문의하시기 바랍니다. Ecclesiastes 10 verses 8 and 9. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 8 and 9. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood <coughs> excuse me, shall be endangered thereby. Let's pray. Here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, the Bible says in verse 8, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. I want to preach about some hedges in the Bible. Some hedges in the Bible. Now, a hedge is a row of bushes or small trees planted close together, especially when forming a fence or boundary. Any barrier or boundary, a hedge of stones, a hedge. And uh, there's a lot of different hedges. I'm going to give you basically five of them here. But by way of introduction, I do want to say that... Uh, there's a, a hedge of authority. And a uh, hedge of authority, uh, there's several P's. Uh, there's the hedge of authority of the parents. Young people, you want to obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, and it may be well with thee, thou mayest live long on the earth, the Bible says in Ephesians 6. Hedge of authority, uh, parents, and then there's the principal of school. And then there's the pastor, this hedge of authority. See, the powers that be are ordained of God, Romans 13, 1 says. The powers that be are ordained of God. So there's the hedge of authority of parents and principal and pastor. And then there's the, the hedge of authority is your paycheck or your employer. All right, there's a, you work for an employer if you have a job. And, uh, and then there's the police, the police officer, law enforcement. And, uh, and then, of course, there's the potentate, God himself. And so there's the hedge of authority, and you are to obey the powers that be. Now, if the powers that be command us to do something contrary to clear scriptures in the Bible, then we don't obey that. We obey the Bible. Right. Peter said we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Acts 5.29 <clears throat> But this hedge here in Ecclesiastes 10 we'll start with this one uh, this hedge here I call this the hedge of sowing and reaping because here in uh, Ecclesiastes 10.8 this is a uh, proverb dealing with property lines and benchmarks uh, according to several verses, we're not going to read them, but I'll just give them to you. Job 627, Psalms 715, uh, Psalms 915, Psalms 357, uh, 5523 of Psalms, 576, and Psalms 9413. Also in Proverbs 26, uh, verse 27. Uh, he talks about this same type of thing back uh, a few pages in Proverbs 26 and verse 27. He says there, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. So you have to be careful uh, about this uh, first hedge here. This is the hedge of sowing and reaping. And... Uh, you reap what you sow. So when you violate a specific Old Testament commandment on property lines, you get what you have coming to you. The hedge in verse 8 here, Ecclesiastes 10, 8, 
as the stones in verse 9 are marks which outline the boundaries of a man's inheritance. And you'll see that, we won't turn there, but in 1 Kings 21 verse 3, about Naboth there and Ahab and and, uh, giving Ahab the vineyard and all that, and uh, Naboth and Ahab concerning the vineyard. So there's a hedge there. Don't lay a trap or a snare for someone else, for you will fall into it yourself. Don't tear down a hedge on someone else's property to enlarge your property. There is liable to be a serpent in the hedge. Verse 8 says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso, verse 9, removeth a stone shall be hurt uh, therewith. And verse 10, If the iron be blunt, and he do not do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable uh, to direct. And so uh, this here is talking about hedges. Uh, You'll notice the serpent of verse 8 is connected with the one and down in verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 10. If the trespasser fails to charm the snake, uh, verse 11 says, "Surely, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. So the serpent of verse 8 is connected with the one in verse 11. If the trespasser fails to charm the snake before tearing down the hedge. You see, the serpent is in the hedge. You can't see him until it's too late. In India, the cobra is charmed with music and dancing. And then the dancing girl kneels down and kisses the cobra. Music hath charms to soothe the savage beast, the old saying says. You can get hurt messing around with stones that stand for a benchmark on a piece of property. And uh, this is almost the same principle as verse 8 dealing with the hedge. I wanted to bring those things out because a lot of folks don't realize that uh, this hedge here is a hedge of sowing and reaping. And one of the things that I've learned in life is that you reap what you sow. And so young people especially, you want to make sure right now and as you grow older, you want to sow good things so you can reap good things. Galatians 6 verse 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that, whatever you sow, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In Galatians 6 verse 7 to 9. And so this is a hedge of sowing and reaping. <clears throat> and Ecclesiastes 10 8 says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. There's hedges in our life. And one of the hedges is the hedge of sowing and reaping. Now you say, who keeps track of the sowing and reaping? God does. It's not a computerized world system. It's God Almighty. He keeps track of over 7 billion people on this earth. And you reap what you sow. You read the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis. And you'll find out that Jacob was a... Jacob means supplanter and poacher. And Jacob was a man who was a wheeler and dealer. Jacob could sell you a clump of dirt for $100 and make you think you're getting a great deal. Make you think you're getting a great dealer, a great deal. And that's the way Jacob was in the Bible. And uh, Jacob was a man that never hardly learned to let God run his life because Jacob had it up here. Jacob had a mind on him. And he could work things out and manipulate. And a lot of times that can be a great travesty to an individual. And God given them a great mind. God gave Solomon all that wisdom there, as I mentioned the other night, in Ecclesiastes there. And he writes it. And uh, he tells about all the... He said, I had more wisdom than all that were before me and riches and everything else. But he commits idolatry. He ends up committing idolatry. So a lot of those things the devil can use if you're not careful and you don't use it for God. And so this is the hedge of sowing and reaping. Now there's a second hedge that I want you to notice in the Bible. Turn back a few pages, a a couple books, to Job chapter 1. 
Job chapter 1. And I want you to see this uh, uh, hedge in Job uh, chapter 1. And look there at verse 8, if you would. Job chapter 1 and verse 8. Here's the second hedge mentioned uh, in the Bible. Uh, Job chapter 1 and verse number 8. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Satan, <clears throat> Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? <clears throat> then Satan answered in, in the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? See, God and the devil are talking back and forth in the first two chapters of the book of Job. And then God doesn't say anything for 35 chapters. God doesn't speak again until chapter 38. A lot of times in our lives, it'll seem like it's been 35 chapters since God has spoken to us. Amen. Amen. Sometimes there's some dry, there's some dry times in our, in our lives. And those are the times that God is teaching you to walk and live by faith. Praise the Lord. Walk and live by faith. You don't always have the goosebumps running up and down your spine. You don't always feel like praising the God and running the aisles. But, amen, like Brother Buddy Blunk always say, he said, praise God on credit. Amen, praise Him on credit. In other words, it'll get better later on. Amen. amen. <clears throat> verse 9, then, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for not? Verse 10, here it is. This is the devil speaking to God about Job. Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Notice in verse 10, Hast thou not made an hedge about him? Watch this and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side. Hey, folks, according, according to the Bible, you say it's just about Job. No, I believe it's about all of us. God has put a hedge about you, and about your house, and about all that you have. And I call this the hedge of sovereign protection. The hedge of sovereign protection. All right, don't get nervous about the word sovereign. I'm not a hyper-Calvinist, amen. But he is a sovereign God, and he does protect us. And this here in verse 10, Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house? Thank God he's got a hedge about our house and about all that he hath on every side. God has a hedge about all that you have on every side. And this is the hedge of sovereign protection. Do you realize that God ends up allowing the devil to take everything that Job has? All ten of his children are dead. He's the richest man in the east. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, and he has all this cattle and all these uh, animals and everything, and he's the richest man and he ends up losing his health and his wealth he has sore boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And his wife says, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? She knew he was a man of integrity. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. You know what she's saying? <clears throat> Job, can't you see God has it in for us? I mean, look. I mean, we got ten caskets at the funeral home of all ten of our kids. Who else has lost all ten of their children, Job? That man went through it. Yes. But I got some good news for you. God ends up blessing him with twice as much as he had before. Amen. He said, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speakest. Because she said, curse God and die. He said, you speak as a foolish woman speaketh. He said, as thou, he said, God, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Whew. So I mentioned there tonight, Job and Paul 
And there's some great Christians down through the church history, down through the centuries. But I'll tell you, Job and Paul were way up here. I mean, I, I wonder if they were living today, if they'd wonder if I was even saved. <laughs> Honestly. The hedge of sovereign protection. He says, the devil says, Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? You ought to thank God God's put a hedge about all that you have. Amen. Yes. Your children, your home, your vehicles, your car, everything you got, use everything you got, God gave you. He's a great, wonderful God, isn't he? And, uh, he? and the devil says, Thou hast blessed the work of his hands. Even the devil knows that it's God that blesses a man, the work of a man's hands or a yes. woman's hands. Yes. I've talked with men through the years and they say, I've worked for everything I've got. I've worked with these hands, this and that. I said, yeah, but God gave you the health and the strength. Amen. The health and the strength to be able to work and be able to provide for your family. And then verse uh, 10, thou hast blessed the work of his hands. This is the devil talking to God. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, talking about Job, and his substance is increased in the land. It's the Lord that blesses your substance. If God don't touch it and bless it, he's, it's not going to be blessed. Look at chapter 3, verse 23. Along these same lines, Job 3, 23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? Sovereign protection. Yes. Sovereign protection. You see that? Uh, I'll get into that more about whom God hath hedged in. But why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? Sovereign. Sometimes God hedges you in somewhere. And he wants you to stay right there. You say, why? I want to get out of there. God might not want you out of there. Amen. God hedges you in. Because it's a hedge of sovereign protection. Sovereign protection. Now, look, if you would, at Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. I want to give you the third hedge. I got five of these. Look at, the, look at this one here in Ezekiel 13. And uh, there's another hedge here that's in the Bible. And this is Ezekiel 13 verse 1. Ezekiel 13 verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. we got a lot of preachers around this country, around this world like that. Verse 4, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Notice in verse 5, here it is. Ye have not gone up into the gaps. Neither made up the hedge. For the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Ezekiel 13, 5 is the verse. Ye have not gone up into the gaps. He says, verse 4, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. How are they like that? Verse 5, ye have not gone up into the gaps. Neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. I call this the hedge of standing in the gap. That's what we need in America. And the verse, another verse for this is Ezekiel 22, 30, a familiar verse. You've heard it preached about probably. God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I wonder how many people are standing in the gap and interceding for America that God won't destroy our country. See, a football team has an offensive line. And it's usually a center that centers the ball to the quarterback. And there's usually uh, two guys on the right side and two guys on the left side. Two guards and two tackles, what they call them. And the center, he centers the ball to the quarterback. 
Quarterback stands behind him and takes the quarterback. And he takes the ball and he you know, passes it or he hands it off to a running back. But there's an offensive line. And each offensive lineman has to stand in the gap and block because there's defensive linemen that are going to try to come in and sack the quarterback for a loss and cause a fumble or get him to throw the ball in an interception or something. So these offensive linemen have to stand in the gap and block. They're responsible <coughs> to block. This one over here blocks. But if the guy falls down, if I fall down or I don't block, that defensive lineman can come in and sack the quarterback and throw him for a loss. And we need Christians, we need preachers in America, like, like your pastor, like other preachers that are here and have been here in this, during this meeting, that will stand in the gap and declare the whole counsel of God. Yes. I mean, stand in the gap for the King James Bible. Amen. Stand in the gap for preaching against sin yes. and naming sin and taking a stand against sin. Amen. God says, I sought for a man among them in 2230. A great verse preached about many times. I've preached on it many times through the years. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap. That's what we need. Make up the hedge. Stand in the gap. That's what this church needs and every church in America that's a Bible-believing church. Uh, and stay in the gap before me for the land, for the land that I should not destroy it. But he says, I found none. I found none. You know what he said over there? A verse just come to my mind. You know what God said about this interceding for the land and standing in the gap for the land? Uh, listen to this. Uh, Isaiah 59 and uh, uh, Isaiah 59, 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. There was no intercessor. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. I know that's Israel, the second advent, doctrinally and all that. But I'm making spiritual application. I'm saying, I wonder if God, I wonder if God wonders why there aren't more men and women who are, not, are interceding through prayer intercessory prayer, and praying for America. You realize God could destroy this country in five seconds yes. if he wanted to. He burned Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. He burned them to ashes. And for years, archaeologists and other different people have scientists for years have tried to find little remnants of it. So I've heard, I don't know, maybe you've heard differently, but I've read through the years that they, haven't, they couldn't even find nothing. They just burned it to ashes. All they found is ashes. Could find no remains of the cities. God rained fire and brimstone out of heaven. Do you know where fire and brimstone usually is, by the way? It comes out of the ground. He rained it from out of heaven. You know where fire and brimstone is mentioned three or four times in Revelation? It's in hell. You know what God thinks of that sin of sodomy? Homosexuality and lesbianism? Right. It's out of the pits of hell. Amen. So he rained fire and brimstone. Genesis 19.24 is the verse, by the way. Genesis 19.24 and, uh, is the verse. And uh, that, that, uh, that uh, fire and brimstone is usually found in hell. Uh, Brimstone is the word in the New Testament for sulfur. And normally that stuff is found underground. In a chemistry lab, when you run a Bunsen burner in the daytime, you are supposed to hang a sign on it, hang a sign on it, and that sign is on there because when you light that burner, that sulfide flame... You can't see it in the daytime, the sulfide flame. And that means the lake of fire, because we got all these little wimpy little 
wimpy little weakling little preachers that say, how can there be eternal darkness and yet there be fire? Fire lights it up. There should be light. How can it be eternal darkness? Hey, dummy. The lake of fire can be outer darkness with fire and still have no light. Bunsen burner, baby. I'm going to say that again. Some of you didn't get it. Brimstone is the word in the New Testament for sulfur. And normally that stuff is found underground. In a chemistry, <coughs> chemistry lab, <coughs> when you run a Bunsen burner in the daytime, you're supposed to hang a sign on it. And, and that's, it's on, that sign's on it that, you know, there's a flame there. Because that, uh, uh, when you light that burner... A sulfide flame, you can't see it in the daytime. And that means the lake of fire can be outer darkness with fire and still have no light. That's good. Well, I'm glad I'm not going there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you're not going to burn? Yes, I have burned the tip of my finger before. Yes. Oh, wow. The first thing you want to do is put it in water. It, that's, what they, I don't know, that's what they told me. I don't know, we might have some doctors and nurses in here that say otherwise, but they told me, so you want to put water on burns, flesh, fleshy burns. You want to get water on it as soon as possible. Mm. But they're in no water in hell. Right. That's right. I preached a message in my church uh, last year before, before our tent revival. We set a tent up in our church, great big old tent. I have a tent revival the end of, the end of May. Every, this year it's May 22nd through 29th, Sunday to Sunday. We go Sunday to Sunday, eight days, every, every night. That and advertising on 10 radio stations, Facebook, YouTube, everything. And uh, flyers and stuff. And uh, I preached a mess. Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached in the 1800s in London, England. He was preaching to thousands of people when he's 20 years old. Somebody gave me, after I got saved in the 70s, they gave me a picture of him and his deacons. And these deacons are old enough to be his grandpa and then some. And there's like 25 of them. He's sitting in a chair, and there's like 25, 30 of these older men behind him. Charles Spurgeon. You know how, you know how he got saved? He got saved. He went to a storefront, uh, storefront if I can get, remember this right. He went to a storefront, and some Methodist preacher, Spurgeon said he couldn't preach a lick, but... He said, he was like, Spurgeon was like a teenage boy, 16 years old over there, I think he was in London. And uh, he, just, he walked inside there and this guy said, young man, you, you know, you're going to hell and this and that and preached to him. He ended up getting saved Amen. and started preaching. And at 19, 20, 21 years old, he's preaching to thousands of people in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. Amen. I've read a lot of his messages, I don't. To be honest with you, I, he isn't one of my favorite preachers, but, but I, I like this one, one message he preached. <clears throat> he preached the, on the... I know he gets a little bit hyper-Calvinist and stuff, but, but he preached on the hell of hell. And he said the hell of hell is that it's forever. Can you imagine burning, your whole body burning forever? Burning forever. That's why, folks, your pastor, that's why I talked about last yesterday about getting that same vision, that same, that same heartbeat that he's got. And I know it, it really it's not really him, it's the Bible, it's God. God has a world vision, but he's got that vision, he's got that heartbeat. He wants to send to Mexico and all these people around the world, Koreans and all over the world and stuff preaching on YouTube and all that. And, and Jean Hall does the same thing. And they're, they, they have a world vision. They want it. God has a world vision. Amen. For God so loved the world. Yes. You know some churches, it's us four and no more. That's what they want. They really, do. they really don't want the church to grow. They'd never admit it. They don't really want the church to grow. They don't want to have outreach in the, all, all the area. The last thing... That Jesus said in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Amen. You know what that is like? Relate that today. 
Jerusalem would be your Los Angeles metro area. Or Ontario. And, right. and then uh, Jerusalem, Judea would be like California. Largest state in the, largest, largest state in the United States. I live in Ohio. You have three times the population. Of course, a lot of people have been leaving the state in the last 10 years, but you still have three times the population yes. that Ohio does. Three times. Jerusalem would be Los Angeles metro area. Judea would be California. Samaria would be the United States. Woo! And the uttermost part of the earth would be the world. Yes. That's the command that Jesus gave when he left. He could have said a lot of things. He could have said, now sit down here, I'm going to tell you how to get rich. You think he said that? <laughs> no, he didn't. He said, come here, I'm going to tell you how to, I'm going to, tell you how to preach. I'm going to, I'm going to teach you how to sing. I'm going to teach you how to build a large Sunday school class. No, all those things are great. But he said, I want you to be witnesses unto me. We need people to stand in the gap. Yes. He said, I found none. Ezekiel 13, 5, you have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. We need some folks to stand in the battle and stand in the gap. The left-wing God-hating reprobates, they're doing their thing. They're pushing all their causes. I call this number three, the hedge of standing in the gap. Number four, look at Lamentations chapter three. Lamentations chapter three. Lamentations chapter three. And you might want to get numbers, numbers 22. We're going over there. I want to show you some things over there. Lamentations chapter three. Lamentations 3 7. Lamentations 3 7. <clears throat> Lamentations uh, chapter 3 and verse 7. <clears throat> Lamentations 3 7. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out, he hath made my chain heavy. Notice that. I'm making spiritual application to the verse. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. That verse goes with the verse I quoted earlier out of Job 3.23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? God hedges you in sometimes. And Lamentations 3.7 says, He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. I call this the hedge of steps that we take. You know, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You see, you trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Your paths, your steps, which way you go, especially you young people, which way you go in your life. You trust the Lord. You look to the Lord. The hedge of steps that you take. And a lot of times, God, and I'm going to show you an example of this in Numbers 22 here in a second as you turn over there. I'm going to show you this. God, a lot of times, will do this. Hedge you in. Some of you, He hedged you into this church. Amen. Yes. You probably didn't realize what was going on right. at the time. Maybe everything was involved. See, God works sometimes. You don't even know He's working. But God hedges you in in different decisions in your life because He has a will for your life. Now, let me show you something about this donkey. And this is encouraging to me because if God can use a stinking donkey, He can use Steve Kogel. 
look at Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. Well, I'll show you some things out of this and then we'll go to my last point. Look at Numbers chapter 22. Because I know everybody's starving to death. Amen? Amen. Numbers 22. Now look at this over here. You've got to see this. Now we've seen the, the hedge of sowing and reaping. We've seen the hedge of sovereign protection, the hedge of standing in the gap. This is the hedge of steps that we take. Look at Numbers 22, verse 22. Numbers 22, 22. All right. Uh, God's anger was kindled because he went. Uh, talking about 21, talking about Balaam. Rose up in the morning, saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab. And God told him not to go, and he went. 22, and God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. So Balaam's riding upon his ass, and the Lord is standing, the angel of the Lord is standing in the way for an adversary against him. So sometimes God will block you. He blocks the steps that you're taking because you're going in the wrong direction. Yes. See? Uh, our, 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 our brother missionary and his dear wife here, uh, they said they're Catholic and then they were Presbyterian and they got the truth of the Word of God and so forth. And we're not cutting down people. We're just saying they got the truth of the Word of God. Amen. We're not cutting down these other religions and stuff. People are, people are deceived about different things. Right. See, that's why you ought to thank God. I thank God, the man that led me to the Lord, he got me in the King James Bible. Amen. And right away, it wasn't 20 years later, I found out the truth about it, and he got me straight about eternal security. Yes. And, about, and then I learned from Dr. Ruckman about rightly dividing the word the a year, year and a half after I got saved. I mean, I looked at things and I thought, that don't make sense. This says this, and this says this over here. I didn't know nothing, I knew nothing about rightly dividing the word. I got into Doc's material. I got, I mean, the late 70s, man, I ordered about a lot of stuff he had. Back then it was cassette tapes. They got everything down in a bookstore in Pensacola. They got everything on CDs now and, and uh, everything. But, uh, but anyways, I studied, and I learned how to rightly divide the word. And Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, James, and Revelation just fell into place for me. Amen. You know, 90, 90 to 95% of the Christians in America don't even know about all that stuff, about the transitional period in the book of Acts and rightly dividing the word of truth and all that kind of stuff. You ought to thank God. Amen. God directed you to the truth. Verse 23, And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. All right, so this donkey, he sees the Lord standing in the way. God will stand in your way sometimes. See, you, but you have to pray. I'm going to make comments as I read here, so you have to kind of look up to me, and then you got to look down, and you got to look up, and you'll be going like this. But, see, you, gotta, you, some, you have to distinguish when you make decisions and when you're trying to find God's will and stuff, is this me, my desire, or is this the Lord, or is this... The devil. Right. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Yes. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. First right. John says. And uh, 1 John 4, 1. All right, verse 23. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. Wow, the angel's got a sword drawn in his hand. <laughs> the ass, watch, watch what this donkey does. And the ass turned aside out of the way, amen, and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. You see that? God, God's using this donkey to get Balaam in the right direction. You'd be surprised who God might use in your life to get you in the right direction. I don't know if he'll use a donkey, but you, you'd be surprised... He does hear in the book of Numbers. Right. You don't know what God can use. All right? Now, look, but look at the persecution that this donkey suffers. He's getting hit. You might get hit. You might get slapped across the face. Yes. You might get cussed out. Right. You tell people you need to get saved or a backslidden Christian. You need to get back in church. You need to serve God. You need to live for God. Yes. Somebody might get mad at you. Right. 24. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. Kind of reminds you of this hedge now, watch. A wall being on this side and a wall on that side. Reminds you of a hedge. Yes. 
And when the, uh, uh, when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself under the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. Uh-oh. And he smote her again. He hits the donkey again. That poor donkey. And all that donkey's trying to... The donkey's doing the will of God more than a human being is. Well, that's sad, isn't it? 26. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. You know what, folks? Some got, sometimes God will hedge you in to where you can't go to the right or the left. You just got to keep going right on. Yes. You say, yeah, why does God do that to me? Because it's his will. Amen. And it's best for you even though you don't understand it, believe it, or see it yet. You're talking about a divine mind of God for your life. He knows you better than you know yourself. 26, and the angel, got, uh, the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, verse 27, she fell down under Balaam and she, this, this donkey just falls down. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. Is that the third time? This poor donkey's getting beaten up. You might get beat up for telling somebody the will of God. You might, see, Paul said, Paul said in Galatians to the Galatian Christians, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16. You tell people the truth, you might get hit. You might get smote. And if they don't physically hit you, they'll hit you with words. They'll lie about you. They'll slander you. They'll persecute you. They'll misrepresent you. This, we live in an evil world. We do. This world's not our home. We're just passing through. Amen. Our treasures are laid up somewhere oh. beyond the blue. Praise the Lord. Yes. This world's not our home. Don't get your roots down in this whole world. I'm telling you, don't do it. That's good. I mean, enjoy your life. Enjoy God gives richly all things to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6. and Enjoy what God gives you and roll with the punches and serve God and live for God. But don't get your, don't get your stakes too far down in this whole world. Right. Because you're not taking nothing with you. Amen. 28. Verse 28. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. Uh-oh, now this donkey's going to start talking. And she said unto Balaam. Imagine, can you imagine a donkey talking to you? Wow, that right there would be enough to get me to think, man, God's trying to speak to me. <laughs> what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? That's what the donkey says to Balaam. And 29, and Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. You know what he's saying? Balaam says, If I had a sword in my hand, I'd kill you. They tried to kill Paul. Forty men made a, made a vow in the book of Acts that they wouldn't eat or drink anything till they killed Paul. I heard a preacher say one time, he said, You know what's wrong with the average Christian today? He said, Nobody wants to kill him. Bunch of mamby pamby Christians. Right. Now I'm not saying go out and do something to be, to, be, to be belligerent and you know purposely get people to hate you and do stupid things. I'm not saying that. But if you live for the Lord, somebody might want to kill you before this thing's over with. I don't know. Some some of us might get killed. I don't know. Right. I mean, it's going downhill pretty fast. This country. Uh, Verse 30, and the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? In other words, I've been your ass. I've been your, the person that you've rode on for ever since you, you know, unto this day. Was I ever want to do so unto thee? In other words, I've never wanted you to do you no know, harm. And he said, Nay. 31, then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. You know what you got to pray? God, open my eyes and open that person's eyes that you're trying to deal with. God's got to open their eyeballs spiritually. 
They might have 20-20 vision physically, but they got spiritual cataracts right. across their eyeballs because yes. they're blinded. We've got a lot of saved people in America that are blinded Amen. to things. Just as blind as a bat back and up backwards. Blind to truth. Verse 31, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. Now we're getting somewhere, Balaam, falling flat on his face now. 32, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. See, when your way is perverse before God, and he don't want you to go a certain direction, in any decision or area of your life, Whatever it is. See, we want God's will for our lives in every area. Not just little matters, but big things, medium size, all decisions. You want the perfect will of God in everything you do, yes. every place you go. Amen. <clears throat> uh, 33, <clears throat> and the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. The angel saying this to, to Balaam, the ass saw me. And turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. You know what the angel of the Lord's saying? Unless she had turned from me, sh surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. He said, You're, what he's saying there, the angel of the Lord's saying to Balaam, you ought to thank God for this donkey because if this donkey would have turned from me and wouldn't have done what I wanted to do, I would have killed you. That donkey literally save the life of Balaam. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to save people's lives. Yes. We're trying to save people's souls. Amen. We're trying to save unsaved people's souls. We're trying to save Christians. They're already saved. So they're going to heaven. But they're, they're, they're all messed up and screwed up in different things right. and everything. You're trying to get there. You're trying to save their life. Yes. Yes. See, Christians... Even saved people, they're going to heaven. Their eternal destination is fixed if they're truly born again. But a lot of them are so fouled up here in this life. Right. So because they're fouled up, their husband or their wife is fouled up, yes. usually, and their kids are fouled up. Yes. So you want to get them because you're saving a whole family a lot of times. Right. When you get somebody saved and you get them in this church, you get them under the Bible, believing preacher and teacher, these preachers and teachers in here, you're... Uh, you get them in here and they're getting under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, they can grow as a family. Amen. Because false doctrine and error is destructive. Yes. You know what Peter said over there? Let's see. Uh, 2 Peter 3.16 They that are unlearned and unstable rest the Scriptures to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3.16. He says, he talks over there, they that are unlearned and unstable. We got a lot of unlearned and unstable people in America. Yes. People say, well, they're saved, they'll be all right. No, they won't if they're not in a Bible-believing church. It isn't just getting them saved. That's the main thing, their eternal destination. They don't go burn in a lake of fire. I understand that. But they got to get into a church. Or they'll be fouled up. You ever seen how many how many fouled up people are about doctrine, about Bible, and different things today? You talk to people. I mean, to even get down to the basic things, you got to get go through all this junk they've been taught. Right. All right, now got through all that stuff. Now we can get down to the basic stuff. You have to deal with them about all these things before you can deal with them about basic salvation in Christianity, because they got all these weird. Doctrinal things they've been taught. They that are unlearned and unstable rest the scripture. You know what resting the scripture is? Taking a verse out of context, taking that verse out, taking that verse. That's what all these cults do, false religions. They don't rightly divide the word, they don't they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. Right. You can make the Bible prove anything you want it to prove yes. by just taking a verse out of context. And that's what all the false cults and false churches and false religions do. Amen. For hundreds of years now. Yes. Uh, 34. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Now we're getting somewhere. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. See, a lot of times we don't know what God's doing in our lives. 
I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. 35, the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak, so forth and so on. So we see there, I call this, number four, the hedges of steps that we take. Number five, turn to Luke 14, I'll be done. Luke 14. There's four in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament that I wanted to show you. Luke 14 is the New Testament hedge. And I've already kind of covered this, so I'll just kind of briefly mention this and we'll close. Uh, Luke 14, 21. Luke 14, 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. That's what God wants us to do. He wants you to do here in this church and churches all over. He wants you to go out into the, quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Bring, them all, bring everybody in here. <clears throat> Get the gospel to them. Yeah. By the way, you see that go out quickly in the middle of the verse there? Go out quickly. That's the only time gen- that you find God in a hurry. Generally speaking, God is not in a big hurry to do anything. He's in a hurry to get people saved. Now, he won't cut corners. He won't compromise. But he's in a hurry to get people saved. He said, go out quickly. You want to know why? Because you don't know when people are going to die. You know what happened? You know that next chapter in Luke 15, remember when the prodigal came back? You know what the father did? Luke 15, 20. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran. The father ran. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The father's running in verse 20. Picture of God the father. He's running in Luke 15, 20. And he says in 14, 21, go out quickly. There is never any verse in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says, well, just take your time. We'll just sit right here. The Lord's coming back. I know he is, but we'll just kind of wait on the Lord a little bit here and and we'll get the gospel out in another 50 years. We'll start getting the gospel out. There is nothing like that in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's go... In Genesis 3, you know, you know who the first missionary in the Bible is? You say Abraham. Nope. You say Gideon. You say Isaac, Jacob. No. Joseph, no. God. Genesis chapter 3, God is seeking Adam and Eve. In the cool of the day, God's going after them. It's a picture of us going after souls. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Jesus said, John 20, 21. Every Christian. You say, that's just the preachers. No! Every, if you're saved, you have the ministry of reconciliation. If you're a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18, the old things are passed away, behold, all things are come new, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, those that are saved, those that have been uh, made new creatures in Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Every Christian is in the ministry. Now, you're not called to preach. You're not called to pastor a church, maybe. But you're in the ministry if you're saved. And you'll be held accountable at the judgment seat for how you got the gospel out. Personally. You, I believe every church will. Because Philippians 4, Paul talked about no church communicated unto me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Talking about giving to Paul, the missionary, getting the gospel out. And uh, he says, uh, uh, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Philippians 4, 14 to 18 and through there. I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Talking to that church at Philippi. I believe every church is going to say the pastor, the church, is going to stand as a church how they got the gospel out. But you personally, individually, 1 Corinthians 3 is the judgment seat of Christ. And every man will receive his own reward according to his own labor. It says there twice, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8 to 15. I call this the hedge of soul winning. 
edge of soul winning. Look at verse 22, Luke 14, 22. I'm almost done. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. I want to tell you something, folks. There's room in heaven for more sinners to get saved and go, go to heaven. Amen. There's room. 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges. There's the hedges. And compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Wouldn't that be something? Yes. Wouldn't that be something if every pew, every chair in this church was filled? Amen. You say, well, we're not concerned about numbers, brother. We're not. <laughs> really? I just, I just preached out of the book of Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> God's concerned about numbers. I'm not saying you've got to get hung up on numbers. I'm just telling you. I'm just trying, right. trying to show you something. There's a book called Numbers. And you ever notice how many times in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, even the New Testament, he says the number of the men was about 5,000 and the number of the women and children, besides women and children, the number was here in the upper room in 120 in Acts chapter 1 and the number, he gives numbers all through the Bible. Right. Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them. Compel doesn't just mean hi. Are you a sinner? Oh, are you lost? Well, you, you ought to think about getting saved. That's that new age. Yeah, that's new age. You ought, you ought to think about getting saved. See you later. Have a nice day. Amen. Compel. Woo! No, that don't mean grab them by the hair of the head and drag them into church. But it means you got to do a little bit of, right. a little bit of oomph, yes. oomph. You know what I mean? Yes. You've got to say, well, sir, are you, are you lost? You need to get saved. Amen. Jesus died for yes. you. Amen. He wants to save your soul Amen. from hell. You're compelling them. Yes. Have a little bit of earnestness and sincerity yes. about you. Amen. A little compassion. Maybe even a couple tears might even come out of your eyeballs. Oh. A hedge of soul winning. Well... tell you whatever we're going to do for the Lord you better do it now right. we're getting older aren't we yes. told my wife the other day I said you realize now some of you older folks are going to laugh at this but I said I told my wife I said in five years I'm going to be 70 I said 70 and if I live 15 more years, which is nothing, it'll go by like that, I'm going to be 80. I said to my wife, it just seems like the other day we got married. It just seems like the other day I was 20 years old. I got saved when I was 20. Here I am 45 years later. Where is 45 years going? Now, people said that to me when I was in my 20s, and I thought, oh, yeah, sure. Sir, it seemed like a million years away. But it seems like I turned around and here I am. I'm telling you, young people, that's why Ecclesiastes 12, Solomon said to bear the, bear, bear the yoke in your youth. When you get older, you can't do the things you used to do when you're younger. My body reminds me of that all the time. I'm not 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 anymore. Whatever we're going to do, we better do for the Lord now. Amen. Amen. Yes. Got to do it now because we're going to stand before God. Amen. Amen. Preacher.